Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode of the Mastering Retention Podcast. Um, super excited. We actually have two guests today, um, and we're going to get to talk about making new games, how to vet concepts, both from a game design perspective as well as a market research perspective. Super fun. So um, I'm Tom Hammond, uh, your host and co-founder of UserWise. Uh, today, I am joined by Yessa Kron, uh, who comes to us from Product Madness, and Stan Minisov who comes to us from App Magic. So we've got uh, multiple spectrums here. Lots of fun. Uh, before we dive into everything, though, um, I always like to ask, like, what's your journey? How did you get into games and, and where you are today? Um, Stan, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the intro and really honored to be here tonight. So yeah, um, I've been in gaming for quite a while, actually. Uh, I had a quite my fun in early days as a child playing different games uh then i really tried to get into the industry i worked for some time as a game journalist actually for a couple of years it was very exciting uh then for a couple of years more i've worked in a gaming company called pixonic actually there were lots of folks out there who know who knew me as stan one of the community managers and producers of the game so guys if you hear this uh, big hi to you and then yeah so I ended up in app magic uh, which is really great because it combines two of my favorite things games on one side and analytics and data driven approach on another that's great yes sir thanks so i just want to also say uh, i'm very honored to be here i'm really happy to join you guys for this conversation and looking forward to it um, my journey in games began uh, with, with my passion as a kid. I, I always loved playing games more than I, I liked reading uh, or watching movies. And, and I was always kind of drawn to them because of, of the feelings they could make me have. Um, I, I found them just as compelling as any other form of media. Um, and my journey into the industry began after my bachelor's degree when I uh, didn't know what to do. And I saw a master's program at my university in the city of Utrecht that was called New Media and Digital Culture. And the last line of the description said that you could study all kinds of things, including games. And I was like, hey, there it is. Uh, let's go for it. Um, and the study was definitely not geared towards game design or, or game industry knowledge. I had to really uh, make it my own, I suppose. And I ended up writing a dissertation on how games tell stories uh, and, and really evaluating emergent storytelling versus more embedded forms of storytelling. I won't get into that here, but um, after that study, I was, um, let's just say, not the most hireable with a humanities master's degree. There weren't a lot of jobs in the gaming industry open for someone like me, especially someone with a passion for narrative at that time. I worked for a while in escape rooms in Amsterdam. I helped build and run very, very successful and beautiful experiences. I also designed and independently produced a board game, the game of Arbor, which I'm very, very proud of. It's kind of my, my heart as a game designer. And I got my break into the, the mobile gaming industry almost two years ago uh, by joining Product Madness. And I have been here as, as a game designer in the new games department, helping to not only design uh, new kinds of products and, and, and new kinds of games, but also dealing with the strategy and the process of making games. So I've had a lot of a lot of learning in that time, and uh, it's gone pretty well, if I say so myself. I'm pretty proud of the work that we've done. That's great. Well, OK. So um, we're going to talk about making new games today. So let's assume the three of us have decided to take the rogue life. We're going to go and, and start our own company, the three of us. And uh, we want to make a games company. Um, but not only do we want to just make games, we want to actually have those games be successful enough that we can take salaries and continue to support our families and keep the lights on so that we can keep making games, right? Um, maybe even have a little profit on there. Um, so we've decided we need to make a new game. What game should we make? Um, that, yeah, so maybe you can take this first. Like, how do you approach, you know, coming up with new game ideas and, and kind of where we want to go? Right. So 
where it starts actually, I think, uh, is in the market, which I think would be something that Stan would like to talk about as well. But um, certainly as a game designer in, in mobile gaming, uh, the, the reality of the situation is that um, there are lots of players out there. There's a huge addressable market, but um, they are playing certain kinds of games. Certain kinds of genres are, are, are popular and uh, successful. And in a market that is, let's just say, saturated, <laughs> Um, with uh, with titles, it's important to be strategic about the choices that we make, about the games, the kinds of games we want to make. So I would start with researching the market and not only looking outwards, but when we look inwards, what kind of skills do we have in our team? You know, are we going to make the next killer match three? Not unless we have really great level designers, um, for example, you know, <laughs> uh, there are all different kinds of designers. There are different kinds of disciplines and strengths that uh, that our hypothetical team has, and we need to evaluate those against the larger market in order to have a good a good fit. That's where I would start. Mm. Stan, where would you start? Oh, actually, yes, it just pointed out. So I would begin with uh, the market research. Uh, I can add that that you really have to be precise about what kind of market do you want to work with. So current m approach to the market is that you usually try to look at some specific genre or niche, or even sometimes subgenre, because there are so many mobile games out there that we have subcategories and subgenres going very, very deep. At the same time, if you want to know is there is a market whatsoever because sometimes you might you might be having a great uh, game idea that you really love but if nobody will play it at the end of the day then well probably it won't be very profitable and we sure will have our fun along the way but once again our families uh, won't be able to eat something so it's not the best idea so just two examples uh the first one is marvel snap going pretty big right now it's a collectible card game uh that was published by well uh by a company actually founded by uh veterans from blizzard making hearthstone and these guys are going big so they've got very good metrics they've got good retention but the market itself if you look at it looks very very dangerous there are lots of publishers out there, lots of games out there. The market itself is very mature and there is a status quo. So it, it is very difficult to enter this market uh, if you don't have a strong IP as Marvel does. And it's really difficult to compete in this market. So for us, I might say, if we don't have uh, any Marvel or Disney license, then this market is not the best idea. Uh, another example is Survivor another big mobile hit uh, that was released a couple of months ago. And this market is growing right now. So it's getting big. There are lots of clones coming up in different settings and lots of them are successful. So they are making money. There are lots of downloads. They can attract their target audience. So it seems there is a way, there is a possibility for us to enter this market. So uh, what I would begin with is trying to understand is there is a market whatsoever, how big it is, uh, whether it is a competitive market, maybe there is a status quo, maybe it is growing or shrinking. By the way, there is one little trick, I might say, uh, that most of the companies out there don't know, and it's pretty useful. So when you are looking at the market and you see that the size of the market is pretty stable, so uh, from the revenue perspective, uh, it is like uh, very, very stable. Usually, it means that this market is so-called trap market. The, the developers there can't buy traffic um, effective enough to have positive uh, ROMI, return of marketing investment. So say for each dollar spent, they receive a dollar back, which is, well, quite all right, but you can scale with these numbers. So they just have to spend money and they receive the same amount of money back. And what it usually means is that um, other game genres that focus on the same target audience, they attract and acquire their user base much better. So uh, for all the folks out there who are looking at the market and thinking, all right, so it isn't growing, 
but it isn't shrinking either. So maybe there is a chance for me. Be careful about it because it can be a trap. It can be a money sucking depth that won't get you anywhere. Mm. It's interesting. So you mentioned a few things um, that I'd like to maybe go a little bit deeper in. So you talked about like, um, I want to see that it's a big enough market or that it's growing. Like, how do I find or evaluate some of these things? Like, assume I don't really know too much. Um, I, I mean, I could assume that the match three market is big because I know of Candy Crush, but like what sort of, you know, detail could I look at to figure out like, should I make a match three game? That's a good question, actually. So for that, usually the analytic tools are used, uh, such as AppMagic, and you can try to analyze the market using these tools. Uh, well, first and foremost, like high-level analysis can be made looking just at top free and top grossing games and uh, separating it from the perspective of different genres. So having all the tags of different categories of our own, it is pretty useful because you can go pretty deep and try to look all the competitors on the market out there. The second step can be trying to work with um, the market itself, so looking at different metrics. And usually we're talking about revenue and downloads because uh, either way we're going for maybe in-app purchases or in-app advertisements, but you have to know what is going on from the revenue and downloads perspective. Another pretty useful metric is RPD, so-called RPD, it's revenue per download. And what it helps to understand is whether the game is monetizing its audience effectively. So ideally, the RPD metric should grow in the beginning and then uh, go and stable on the plateau trying to reach the LTV. So like when we take it to the infinity, the RPD should meet the LTV and be the same. But in reality, usually it isn't so but it's pretty useful to understand how other competitors on the market are working with this metric in order to understand uh, how you should address it, maybe what type of games you should look at and deconstruct, decompose in order to make a successful game of your own from monetization perspective, from game design perspective. Mm. Yeah, so I'd like to jump in here and, and yeah, um, the metrics, the metrics are extremely important. Um, as, as indicators of, of, of how a game is doing, how the market is doing in, in a broader sense. And I, I do have to put on my game designer hat and, <laughs> and throw in that those things are all well and good to see those things, to, to have sophisticated tools that help us understand and break down, you know, games and their near neighbors, for example, how they're doing. But then you have to go in and you have to play. Um, Revenue numbers, retention numbers, they are just the surface, in fact. You know, we, we, we don't know what is making the game tick on the inside. What is the experience that the player is being given that makes them want to stay? Uh, and that is the thing at the end of the day that, that drives our industry. You know, um, while I, I see the value of, of, um, of KPIs, for example, there's one KPI that's the hardest to measure, and that is the, actually the most important one, which is fun. Um, where is the fun in the game, and how do we measure that? Well, that's really, really hard. That's a that there is no. Well, let's just put it this way: the person who can come up with the, the measurement for that, um, they could make a lot of money, I think, in 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 the uh, in the data analysis community, I suppose. But you have to play. You have to go and see in match three, and and to be and you have to be honest with yourself as well. Um, there may be a market there, but if you are not able to, with your team, execute against the standard being set by the by those who lead that market, you might be in in store for a, a huge wasted amount of money to attempt to build something that maybe will never catch the eye of the player who already has really great offering of games to choose from. Mm. Do you think, I'm going to go back to you, Yessa. Um, do you think that there are elements where talking to existing players actually makes sense? Um, or maybe people that by all accounts 
should be playing, but maybe aren't. Absolutely. So I, I, I live and work in London um, and I, I uh, commute on the tube every day. And on the tube, you see all manner of people playing all manner of games. And as a game designer, I have to stop myself from not just tapping someone on the shoulder and saying, excuse me, can you please tell me why? What do you like about this game? I'm, I'm very, very curious to know because I think, Tom, you, you bring up a really good point. And I think there definitely is value in speaking to players um, before even going into a market. And uh, large companies like my own have, um, you know, resources in place to do that kind of research they, they, they see they see the value of this and it is an amazing resource to us as as, as new games uh, designers and, and uh, yeah, product managers etc that's great um, um if i can i'll i'll, I'll yeah. just like to jump in yeah yeah uh i totally agree with yes here so it is really important to know your audience and to focus on your audience to even sometimes it, it isn't it, it 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 is even more important to work with people that don't play as you've mentioned tom at the same time you have to be really careful about it especially when you already have a pretty successful product you usually have some kind of a community around it of loyal players and at some point they usually will be loud enough to tell you that they don't love something and it, it will happen sooner or later just believe me in any kind of product in any kind of project it will happen so you have to remember that usually these people are so-called vocal minority and not all the things they're talking about should be implemented in your product well first and foremost because sometimes what you're hearing is uh more on a like symptom side not the disease itself and you want to cure the disease so you have to use your experience, know what is going on inside the product itself, but at the same time, listen carefully to your audience in order to understand, all right, so these are the things they're talking about. These are the features that they want, but what do they really need? What do they really require that we can give to them? So I actually have a, an example from my own uh, experience, albeit far outside of, of mobile gaming when I was making my board game. I was doing playtesting. It's the most important step of, of any game design process. Um, but I was doing playtesting in the only way that I could, which was to sit down with a couple of people, watch them, and listen to them play. And oftentimes, someone would play the game for the first time, and they would have encountered a mechanic that maybe got in their way, didn't let them do what they wanted to do in the game. And afterwards, when I asked in my you know most zen-like way, can you please tell me all the ways in which my game <laughs> frustrated you and, and the things you didn't like, they would point out that thing. And at the beginning, I was very reactive. I would then go back to the drawing board and change that thing immediately. But over time, and after like a hundred play tests, I came to understand that oftentimes, exactly as Stan just said, they are reacting to something they experienced that, that was being caused by another issue. There was a, a deeper flaw in the game that was kind of creating an issue down the pipeline of the experience. And it's very important to understand the genre that you're working in and the mechanics of your game specifically when you're dealing with player feedback, because you know they may indeed just be reacting to something that they don't even fully understand, but it doesn't mean their feedback is, is not legitimate. It just means that it needs to be taken with a grain of salt and, and needs to be analyzed uh, with the team accordingly. Yeah, that's great. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. But uh, I, Stan, I, I want to talk to you a little bit. Um, this is more on the research side. So if you look at, let's say, the top grossing mobile games, just about every top grossing mobile game, and even non mobile games, even like World of Warcraft, League of Legends, just about every major game that's out there is not actually new. Like, World of Warcraft was not the first MMO. Candy Crush was not the first match three. Um, Clash of Clans, I forgot where that one came from, but that was not like it was a, a reiteration of the game. They maybe simplified it, redid it a little bit. But most of the top games that are out there didn't just like come out of nowhere. They kind of came from something else. Um, 
So I'm curious, you know, from a market research perspective, like, do you have any tips or thoughts or, or recommendations around like, how do I figure out where one of these maybe gems is sitting that I can take, put on the the right polish and redo and, and bring it to more of the masses? I mean, really all that Candy Crush did was it took Bejeweled and it made it mobile friendly and they added a little bit of a saga to it, right? That's true. That's true. That's a very good question. And that's a, like a million dollars question, I might even say. So there are several different approaches you can try to use. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, lots of folks out there try to use it, especially the big companies. You try to look at the market, but not from the top perspective. You don't look at the giants, but you rather look at the uh, someone who is growing very fast. So usually what you're looking for is someone who merged different play styles or merged different ideas successfully enough to become a new genre a new hit so ideally when you're looking for the new big thing you are not just trying to look for you know like little improvements in already existing formula but rather something new that can come up from combining already existing patterns and already existing genres and for that, you can try to look at games, for example, in soft launch. So big companies out there tend to not risk their brand and test their hypothesis using uh, smaller companies and launching games from these companies' uh, pages. So after they reach benchmarks uh, from revenue, from maybe a retention perspective, after they receive positive feedback and after they're sure that they can acquire users effectively, so they've tested all the user acquisition side, then uh, something called global happens. So go in like in a global launch in all the countries out there. But uh, if you are smart enough and you have an opportunity to see this jam when it's not yet on a global scale, then you might have a chance to use maybe some of the ideas in your game in order to go big. The second thing is try to look everywhere because sometimes uh, the inspiration might come from different sources you might not even expect. For example, the game Survivor I've just mentioned, uh, the initial idea of the gameplay came from an indie PC game, Vampire Survivors, which became really popular but among a very local small audience of players, not mobile players. But uh, the publishers saw it as an opportunity. They used the gameplay formula because they knew that in, co in the core, it worked really well. Then they added uh, some kind of uh, meta and monetization from their previous projects. And they were pretty sure about them because uh, they've already used it in their other games like Archer. All. And then they had this polished product that, that had both the very uh, catching core gameplay and well-built meta and monetization that will help game to be profitable. So this can be the second approach. Um, maybe sometimes you might want to copy already popular decisions on the market. It can work, but once again, I have to warn you that you have to be big enough to scale this type of game. So if we're talking about a new launched company, there is no way you can try to, for example, launch your, your own world of Warcraft using already existing ideas. So the, the question here is that you have the experts, the specialists, you have a better understanding of the market, maybe you have the better marketing team, maybe bigger budgets, and then you can scale up using the same core idea, but on a bigger audience. And yeah, Actually, in the mobile world for the last uh, 10, maybe 15 years, uh, the marketing itself and user acquisition was as important as game design. Because if you make a great game with interesting gameplay, but no one knows about it, then there isn't much chance for you to be really successful. Because of the algorithms uh, the mobile stores use, like App Store and Google Play. That's great. Yeah, you actually brought up something I was going to ask you afterwards. We already kind of addressed it, um, which was, you know, non-traditional ideas. It seems like looking strictly like if you want to make a mobile game, looking just at other mobile games is probably going to give you the wrong idea. So I was kind of curious, like, <clears throat> do you have any 
tips or recommendations around looking at like popular Roblox games or Minecraft versions or Fortnite creative or PC or something that's out there where we could maybe see, Hey, this is maybe something or like I can see the beginnings of something there. It almost like, uh, you know, the record producer that listens to the demo, but inside that demo, they can kind of, you know, hear what that song could be with the right, you know, team and stuff on it. Um, I don't know. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, is that a good idea or is that a a bad idea? Yeah. I think, I think when we're in, again, the the market is is saturated. Um, where it's no longer the wild west when any old game could could make it huge because there wasn't that much competition a couple of things I, I i was thinking of when stan was talking indeed you know you don't just wake up one morning and make world of warcraft world of warcraft came from the games that came before it and actually in fact this is the story of all games ever made um all games are iterative they are you know learnings that have been passed through new minds and then new outputs come in many ways um everquest was stuck you know they they didn't have they they were stuck with their code they were stuck with their design decisions they were stuck with their player base blizzard could just be like what are the things that annoy us most about everquest and what could we improve and then they just made that and they had the the luck that it that it got as big as it did um yeah, so iteration and thinking iteratively is really important. So to your point, draw inspiration from everything. Draw inspiration from from um, from Roblox, from console games, from from board games. You know, there, there are there are um, good game design is actually medium agnostic. Uh, mobile games, sure, they have certain kinds of affordances and. And you can use, for example, haptics, like the fact that we have a touch screen to create fun interactions. But if your mind is open to finding good ideas everywhere, then you have a greater chance of actually finding. And for example, um, although I can't really name the games that we're working on right now, we, we're trying to act in this way at Product Madness. This is, this is our, our belief, at least as game designers in the new games department. Is, let, let's use everything we can um, to find inspiration while rooting it, as Stan was saying, in that which already is. I like to say um, familiar, but innovative, right? Root yourself in the familiar, but do add that spice because otherwise you won't stand out in this market. That's great. And actually, mm. just one thing to add, uh, it can be shown on the data and market as well. So if you are thinking about being innovative and traditional at the same time, uh, one of the things you might be thinking about is making a copycat of an already existing popular game, but with a different setting, maybe different some, some different mechanics. So going into the slightly different direction. And for example, for our Archer games, we've made a research of our own. And we saw that there were lots and lots of uh, like copy games going out. But what was happening is that these games, they were like uh, popular for a couple of months and then they disappeared from the radars. So like they didn't stand a chance in the market. At the same time, Arch- Archero itself, after being quite successful for some time, it began to shrink. And though it was quite successful for a while and still is, uh, the market itself became uh, less and less attractive. So if you're trying to be innovative and traditional at the same time, the first idea that might come to your mind is trying to take a popular idea that out that is out there that is already performing good because, well, that is like... Uh, the best way to know that the idea is popular, it's already rocking up. But at the same time, if it's already growing, if there are someone that used this idea successfully, this means that you are already late. Actually, so Marvel Snap's a good example. Um, there are lots of CCG games out there, and certainly these, uh, these uh, makers are, are from the Hearthstone team, so they definitely know what they're doing. But they have created an innovative game. I don't know if you've played it yet, but 
it's like a CCG unlike any other. It's very quick. It's very uh, dynamic and um, not super deep in terms of strategy. I don't have to worry about, oh, my cards are, my deck is blue red. You know, it's, it's no Magic the Gathering. Um, and they are actually, their UA campaign is reflecting it as such. They are marketing it as a fresh new take on the CCG genre. So I think in Marvel Snap, we have an interesting example that certainly will over time become clear, you know, does that approach work? Did this approach work? Did simplifying the CCG uh, lead to success? And of course, they also have their cosmetics driven um, meta, which is also interesting. So uh, that's a game to watch, in my opinion. They're, they're doing something interesting there. So the interesting thing with Marvel Snap, um, I happen to have a buddy that uh, has worked there with them, both, um, both teams. Um, when they created Hearthstone, really what they tried to do is they tried to make Magic the Gathering more accessible, but on the PC. They then <clears throat> kind of took that same playbook that nobody actually figured out and used and did the same thing with Marvel Snap. They said, okay, how do we take Hearthstone and make it quicker and more accessible for people on the mobile devices? So they kind of like mm. just reuse that playbook. So it's again, like, how do we take this and make it more accessible for other people like that? Um, I think World of Warcraft did that same thing with EverQuest and some of those other MMOs out there that were super, super punishing at the time that they said, hey, this is fun, but how do we make this more accessible? How do we solve those problems that we really hate about that ourselves? And it became more accessible for other people. Um, yeah. So I think that's a very interesting take. Um, that's, that's true. That's true. But once again, it doesn't work every time. So from our <laughs> conversation right now, yeah, you got to yeah, be lucky. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there is a good example on the market right now from one of the giants, one of the biggest guys, Supercell. They've launched their Clash Quest uh, in the soft launch like for a couple of years. And basically it was once again the same approach. You take an already existing genre and you try to simplify it. And it seems that, well, of course, we don't know it's from, from the inside, but based on the Reddit, based on their communication with all the players, that they didn't reach their benchmarks because they were too simple for their hardcore players. So players mm -hmm. that already loved the genre itself, they didn't really love it. It wasn't deep enough. But at the same time, it was too difficult for casual players mm -hmm. out there who were looking for mm -hmm. something new. So like this, it's, it's a very narrow path <laughs> you might want to, to take here. Yeah. So I want to talk about something a little bit different. Um, and, and that's this whole idea of IPs and stuff. So when does it make sense? And maybe Stan, I'll start with you. Um, when does it make sense to take a already successful game, genre, what have you, and just kind of reskin it to be you know more IP based? Like I know the economy is solid here. I know this. I'm going to get some marketing advantages, maybe get some people in that, you know, they weren't able to reach because they didn't have this IP, but I already know that everything, you know, quote unquote works. Um, that's a great question, actually. I'd say that uh, the whole idea works and we can look at the market and we can see examples out there that work as well. But uh, you, at the same time, you should be once again careful about it. So you have to approach it really thoughtful. First of all, you have to be sure that the core gameplay and the game that you are working with somehow reflects the, the IP that you are working with. So say for if you are, if you are talking about uh, some kind of a Star Wars game, maybe you would love to look at uh, collectible mm -hmm. heroes part. Oh, once again, Marvel Snap, there is a lot of things going from the collectible cards part and not just even collectible card games on PC or on mobile, but back in, in the days when we were having this like uh, card ca ca cardboard cards, plastic cards, sometimes they collect them, play with them. So it really brings nostalgia back and it aligns well with the gameplay itself. And it's really important because when you've got an IP, but it doesn't really sit well on the gameplay itself, the feeling can be a little bit dif difficult. So this game will have some kind of a profit, of course, because you've got a low audience, you've got a low fan base. But at the end of the day, when we are trying to create a new game, especially using big IP, 
what we are trying to reach usually is maybe an even broader audience. So attract both our mm-hmm. already existing loyal um, loyal fans, and at the same time, broad our fan base. So I'd say it's really important to align well your gameplay with the IP itself. Mm, and sometimes it can be difficult, so you have to be sure about it. The other thing is um, you have to think really well about the live ops. So right now, when working with mobile games, uh, you don't just uh, release them and set them sailing. So yeah, yeah, see you and just grab the money. So you want to address games as a service and have an updates like each month, each quarter, uh, topic-based, thematic-based with different live ops, with new quests, new personas, new heroes, new some kind of rewards. And that is where, from my experience, IPs really shine. Because especially when you've got a big IP, for example, take, I don't know, Disney Kingdom, you've got all these Disney heroes out there and you can expand it just like almost to the, to the, to, to the infinity and beyond, quoting. <laughs> so, nice. uh, you, yeah, yeah, you can make uh, some kind of a uh, live ops update with the Incredibles family, with a quest system of their own, with new heroes, with new maybe visual visuals, with new uh, part of the game that unlocks when you complete all the quests. Then you might have some kind of a um, new update with Marvel heroes, especially when there is a new film coming up, like, I don't know, uh, Wakanda Forever, and you've got this like new Wakanda continent with all the new heroes, new quests, and, and so on. So it's really wise not just to think in the moment, but in the perspective, understanding how can you build the live ops in the years to come. Not just right now, but how can you attract players and make them play your game, not just like he- here and now, but in half a year, in a year, in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And if you've got a really big IP, if you've got movies, you've got comic books, then you can align things happening up in the game with all other type of medias, which, well, if done correctly, can be absolutely tremendous. So it can be absolutely fantastic, but it's really difficult. Yeah, that's great. Yes, anything to add? So, you know, Stan, you sound uh, you sound like a game designer. That you, I, I can't I can't agree more. Um, with pretty much everything you said. Uh, IPs are an incredible tool, but they're also fraught with challenge because indeed there, there's a potential for not matching you know, mechanics with the feeling of the IP and that creates a dissonant feeling for the player, which we don't want. Um, also, IPs are delicate, you know, especially when you're working with a big one. Star Wars, for example, there are people out there who really, really care about it. And, You need to represent it faithfully. Also, working with an IP can be particularly challenging because there will be guardians of that IP looking over your shoulder at all times, as they should. So while it's a great asset, it does does bring uh, challenges with it. But I wholeheartedly agree as well that uh, IPs with well-developed worlds um, lend themselves to live ops, which are indeed essential to to modern free-to-play games live service games. Yeah, that's actually a, a good thing to note about IPs. So um, with UserWise, you know, we do live ops tooling and, and things like that. Um, and you can do a ton of stuff with it. Um, like I could actually enable the marketing team to be able to change um, really anything in the game based on the ad that the user saw or whatnot. So in theory, I could have, if you saw the Princess Jasmine ad, I drop them into Princess Jasmine players and they get the Princess Jasmine chapter of content first. Yeah, and if you that's super add, strong. I could do that. But I actually can't if I'm working with Disney because Disney's got to like, oh, they've got to see every little step of the way and you can't just change that without that. So not having an IP, like, yes, I can do that with my tooling, but I have this kind of IP overload that I have to like add an extra three to four weeks of process to come in. So you know, even though you've got great tooling where I could have a hundred different versions of something running or change things really easily, you can't necessarily do that with IP. So it's definitely something to like keep in mind and be aware of and maybe even like try to talk to people that have worked with that particular IP in the past to understand like what's their process like, because I think some are a little bit more flexible than others. Yeah, it's uh, for example, if your game is story driven, 
in any way and you are using an IP, um, the narrative designers on that team are going to have a really hard time. And the, the process is going to be slow. I think uh, what you said, Tom, about adding that three, four weeks, sometimes maybe a month or two to the process, that's kind of anti-live ops design, right? <laughs> we need to move quick. Uh, we need to keep users engaged. So either you have, you know, one heck of a pipeline that is producing stuff, uh, you know, a year out. Um, otherwise, you know, be careful, I would say, with, with, with IPs. Yeah, yeah, that's true. A rephrasing, uh, we might say with great IP comes great bureaucracy. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, yeah, I, IPs are interesting. Like, you know, even comparing like uh, Pokemon Unite to Wild Rift, like Wild Rift, yeah, I'm looking this up in App Magic. In the West, they have a little over a four dollar revenue per download and about a two dollar, you know, global. But Pokemon Unite is at a fifty five cent global and a dollar, basically, uh, for the West, a dollar seventy three cents for the East. Um, so it, it's definitely interesting, like similar like gameplays and stuff, but you can't just like slap the IP on and hope that it works. I think because Wild Rift went through and solved a lot of those nuances for MOBAs so that it actually feels really good on, you know, mobile. And they add a little bit more depth than maybe you might have on Pokemon Unite. Like they added some stickiness that can lend towards better live ops and better revenue. Um, I have to say, I love Pokemon Unite. It's one of my, my go-tos. Uh, I, I learned long ago, I'm no Dota player. So the, <laughs> the more casual MOBAs for me. And I do have to say that from, from a game gameplay to IP synergy standpoint, I think they did a good job. You know, like I'm, I'm playing as, you know, wiggly tough and putting people to sleep, just like in the cartoons. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. So, like, and, and then, so it works for me and it makes me smile because it definitely hits my nostalgia bone. And that's again, that kind of ephemeral fun. They do have that. And I don't have those connections with characters from Wild Rift as much as they're cool. And maybe the gameplay is deeper. I'm I'm just one player, but uh, it, it works for me. So. Actually, That's here I'm, I'm more on a Wild Rift side because uh, I haven't much of a experience with Pokemon's back in the days. Uh, only with the cap, so-called caps, the round cardboard caps you could, could play with. But League of Legends uh, have been for quite a while in my life, and. Uh, I've tried Wild Rift and we've got some kind of a tradition like once in a half a year I download it once again I play for a week and then I uninstall it and say okay so let, <laughs> let's meet in half a year <laughs> darling so yeah, it's, yeah. It, I, I, I might say that uh, they, the guys did what I actually never thought could be possible they took the core gameplay of PC uh, MOBAs and they introduced it to mobile and it played really smooth, like unbelievably smooth. I never thought it can be. Yeah, they they had to work with it really carefully. And they uh, one of the reasons uh, the roster of heroes for Wild Reef is much smaller than for the like big League of Legends, because not all of the, all the, all, all of the heroes can be used on mobile phones as effectively as on PCs or consoles. So yeah, I'd say that the initial material was very strong, but it came with its constraints and they perfected it. So the result was really brilliant. And yeah, as you've just mentioned, Tom, they really uh, had a good experience with all the live ops, with all the updates in the like main League of Legends as well. So they knew what they were doing and they played it really great on mobile platforms. So with all the live ops, understanding how to uh, give new players what they wanted at the same time how to work with their core audience that already loved the game and knew all the characters out there knew their stories so the combination was really successful and we we can see it in the app magic or other instruments as well so they they're going really big and strong love it well guys i, I know we're pretty much out of time here so i do have one final question because we are in the mastering retention podcast of course and that is you know, what's one tip or trick or lesson you've learned over the years to increase retention? How do you keep your players playing for longer? Stan, do you want to go first? Oh, that's tough. Um, 
Okay, so <laughs> actually I will play here on Yes's side and I must say that if you want to keep the retention really good and if you want to be sincere with your players, then when you're creating a game and developing a new one, the first thing you want to think about is the fun, the essence of the gameplay, understanding why the audience will stick with this game in years to come. Because uh, usually when you're developing a new title, it's really difficult to understand what will happen with it in a year. What will be the market like? How will you communicate with your players? The game can be absolutely different in a year's perspective. And usually the companies, they like address the day one retention, day seven retention, maybe then day 30. And it's pretty understandable because if your players leave your product at like in the first month, it really doesn't matter what you were aiming at in a year's perspective. At the same time, you have to think about it because that's uh, the way to create a really successful and interesting product. That's great. Yes, sir. All right. So I've listened to this podcast before, so I prepared. I, I thought about this. Um, I was thinking to myself, what, what would be my answer? And I came upon this. I think that retention starts on D0, day zero, you know. And what happens the first time that player opens the app they experience the FTUE, the FTUE, as, as we refer to it, the first time user experience. It cannot be understated, in my opinion, the importance of carefully, thoughtfully, and successfully designing a strong first time user experience. Um, you know, we've used the word tutorial for this in the past, you know, like maybe a little icon pops up and some text is told to you about what you need to do in a particular moment. I'm looking at lots of Forex strategy games out there that are overloading you with information the first time you open the app. I don't find these well-designed first-time user experiences, but in my experience, um, allowing the player to not just learn how to play the game, but experience the game as if it is unfolding before them. You know, Give the player time to understand the core mechanics and then Later on, layer in, you know, a bit of the meta, uh, a bit of a bit more depth here, and and then only show them live ops after you are sure that they understand the foundations that the game is built on. Um, I think the greatest thing that games can do to to improve their retention is indeed to make sure that that first experience is one that hooks the player, that does not overwhelm them, and that actually makes them curious to want to explore the game and go deeper. And indeed, um, that's one way, as Stan was just saying, to, to make that proof of the fun. You know, you have to explain to your players why the game is fun. It might be brilliant, but if, if I can't pick that up in my first session, I'm never going to see all the hard work and, and beautiful ideas that, that, that the team has put into the, the product. So that would be my answer. Very cool. I like it. Um, I'll add one little tidbit. Um, because we were talking about Wild Rift, um, <laughs> what makes me stay around in that game? Just about like any other popular game, there are typically some sort of emotional, psychological high point. So if I'm playing Candy Crush or Royal Match, that high point is having one turn left and finally managing to set up that big explosion where I blow the map, I win the level, everything's there. It's in League of Legends. When I carry my team... I get, you know, 18 and three, I'm MVP. I get that S score, like high point. I will play another 50 games as whoever I just played before. Even if it's a terrible champion, I'm getting destroyed over and over again, chasing that feeling, that moment again. That is what drives true retention, I think. Yes, I think that's a really good point. And I would just say those moments are designed. That moment in Candy Crush is designed. And actually, the moment that happened just before where you did lose, that's also designed because um, great elation follows the fall. You know, um, game design is about uh, losing and winning because you can only appreciate the win, that moment that you're describing right now, Tom, with, with such passion, because you've been stomped by other people, you know. So then you turn around and when you get a chance to stomp people in the Wild Rift, you feel amazing. And these are the moments, this is the fun, this is the intangible thing, but it is something we need to investigate and, and, and good game companies know how to do that well. Love it. 
Well, thanks, guys. Uh, if folks do have you know any questions and want to get in contact with you, is, is there a good way to do that? I Sam, think, go ahead. Um, yep, yep. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, using the LinkedIn, uh, there's Tan or Tanislav Minasov might be fine. And you can also check appmagic.rocks. That's the website for our tool. That uh, And th there is actually lots of free stuff out there that you can try to play with and to analyze the market if you are thinking about a new game or app to create. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, you can reach me best uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is uh, Jesse Kroon, but it's spelled J-E-S-S-E-K-R-O-O-N. It's a Dutch name, so it's a bit complicated, but uh, happy to talk. I love talking about game design and, and, and the industry that we all call home. So really open to it. Love it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.